Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, actually, we are very glad to, to let you know that we have uh, more than 150 registered, registered participants from actually all over the world uh, for our GOVT multiplier event. This is a webinar organized in the frame of an EU funded project on uh, virtual technologies in geomorphology, a uh, project which deals uh, especially with uh, geoheritage and geohazard, and consider, of course, scientific issues, but especially educational uh, issues. Uh, we have a dedicated uh, virtual reality platform, but you will know more about the project uh, uh, from one of the partners of the, the, uh, the project itself, Niki Velpido, uh, that will introduce and give an overview of uh, the project. Um, actually, uh, the project is uh, run under the Erasmus Plus program and the Key Action 2, which is a partnership for cooperation under, of course, the, the, the funding of the European Commission, as I mentioned before. And the project aims to propose uniform and integrated teaching guidelines that promote uh, distance education by utilizing the most recent trend in uh, technologies. This project, uh, the idea of this project started during the COVID period and uh, when uh, the a real need for distance uh, communication and teaching um, grew, grew up. Uh, and so as an answer, as a possible answer to uh, this real need that emerged during that time, our project was thought and uh, uh, we were glad that the European Commission thought it was uh, uh, worth uh, uh, funding it. So um, I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, webinar also on behalf uh, of uh, the project coordinator, Arjen Stroven from the University of Stockholm. And um, I, I also greet you on behalf of the executive committee of the, um, the Italian Association of Physical Geography and Geomorphology, IGEO, uh, which gave uh, the auspices uh, to this event. And I'm grateful to the executive committee of our national Italian association for this uh, um, sponsorship. Actually, uh, this is a, a topic that in, in our country, but not only, is uh, of great importance. It's a topical issue. Um, and uh, our Italian association have working groups uh, dedicated to geoheritage and geohazard. And uh, more and more virtual technologies have to be taken into account if we uh, wish to embrace the study of geoheritage and geohazard in a proper way in modern times. Um, I don't want to um, steal time to the speakers, and, and so I will immediately pass the torch to the president of the International Association of Geomorphologists, Professor Sunil Kumar De, who is connected from India. Um, and I, I would like to thank him very much for being with us today and bring his contribution uh, from an international uh, perspective. So Sunil, the floor is yours and uh, please give your uh, thank you very, to the much, Mauro, very much Mauro. Uh, on behalf of the International Association of Geomorphology, I welcome this uh, Professor Mauro Soldati, our former president of IAG, <clears throat> the this uh, working group chairperson, Professor Nika Ivalpidu, Professor Paolo Croza, Dr. Vittori, and all participants from different parts of the world. So it's my pleasure to give an introductory of in this GOVT webinar. Uh, this is a GOVT multiplier event, and the VT means it is virtual technologies in geomorphology, and it is from geoheritage to geohazards in between many, many this geomorphological issues are falling. 
now i will just see a few words about the com- contemporary scene in geomorphology why this uh, geo hazards geo then geo heritage sites all these things are coming now with this increasing concern with the complexity and non linear dynamics in geomorphology many things are evolving especially since since this uh, pleistocene period during holocene period when human intervention as well as this climatic climate changes are altering the geomorphic processes in in different places in different rates moreover with the advancement in measurement technology then increasing computational and information processing capabilities enhanced collaboration with other disciplines and more concern about the practical aspects of climate change and human impacts on geomorphological systems has evolved this uh, has evolved and demanded this contemporary branches in geomorphology so with this we need to understand why geomorphological hazards takes place maybe it is due to natural due to human intervention but uh, ultimately when nature tries to see that uh, and and uh, a disequilibrium is created within the nature the nature tries to stabilize it and when it tries to stabilize it sometimes it creates calamities and this calamities go goes beyond our this uh, uh, capacity carrying capacity that is why we call it a hazard so this is one of the most important aspect so with this this uh, uh, contemporary scene different branches in geomorphology have been evolved for example climatic geomorphology geomorphic sensitivity bio geomorphology tectonic geomorphology terrestrial geomorphology archaeo geomorphology geomorpho sites and geo heritage sites environmental geomorphology in which the geomorphological hazards in a important component after that anthropogenic geomorphology connectivity in geomorphology virtual geomorphology dangshia geomorphology river hill so all these branches have come up to fulfill the demands of the nature as well as the environment so our international association of geomorphology was established in 1986 after that we have been this uh, supporting many unique this uh, geomorphological working groups in which these two this geomorphological hazards and geomorpho sites are the two important working groups geo geo morpho sites was a working group since 2001 it is still today continued sorry and up to 2022 it continued but it had given a different name and not only this our previous conference which a regional conference in geomorphology uh, of the international association of geomorphologists which was just held in in the last uh, two weeks before in cappadocia turkey and they have kept the topic also this is geo geomorpho sites and geo heritage sites so this is an important branch in geomorphology nowadays because one paper i had seen that a value of geomorphology how to sell geomorphological knowledge how to sell geomorphological aesthetic beauty and all these things so this is naturally an important component as well as we have started me and irasima alcantara aila we started this geomorphological hazard working group in 2005 from zaragoza till today it is continuing of course some uh, some other this academicians they have taken over but this is also an important branch in geomorphology which which we need to address so after this this covid period especially post covid period this the need of this virtual mode of geomorphology has become an important part not only in geomorphology but also in all academic branches because we have seen the fury of this covid we could not go out from our home then many of the geomorphologists of the world thought that why can't we go through this virtual technologies we can show this 360 degree views of different field areas we can show the different processes which are being operated in different areas so that is why this virtual component or virtual geomorphology or virtual technologies in geomorphology has become an important component in in geomorphology so from from this point of view i think we thank this professor nika nikki valpido to propose this group 
in the, in the last 10 year of our iag executive committee to propose a working group on virtual field trips in geomorphology and also we have done several meetings on this issue with nikki through online mode and through which we have found that this is of course an important branch is going to be an important branch in geomorphology without going to field in many cases when we do not get fund when there are other inconveniences also so this is a uh, important branch so we need to train the youngsters about this virtual technologies in geo geomorphology to address the issues of these geomorpho sites and geo heritage sites so with these few words i think i i i should not take more time from from vitori and from paula because we we are eager to listen them so on behalf of the international association of geomorphology once again i welcome to this important webinar as well as i will i i will request you to keep your questions to the presenters so that you can understand more so once again i thank you mauro for you for inviting me in this very important webinar thank you very much thank you sunil for for being with us and representing such an important international association like uh, the ieg uh, i see that the number of participants is increasing I would like to let uh, those uh, who connected just uh, now that the, the, the webinar is recorded, so it will be available also afterwards if you would like to uh, attend it. Um, now it's uh, the time for presenting, for giving an overview of the, the GOVT project. Um, and uh, I ask uh, our colleague uh, Niki Evelpidu from the National Kapodistrian University of Athens, uh, who is responsible for her team uh, within uh, the GOVT project and uh, who was uh, uh, one of the main uh, proposers of this uh, of this project uh, to uh, to tell us uh, something about this very interesting project. I see, I see Niki. So good morning, Niki, and uh, the floor good is. Good morning. Here. Good morning, Mauro. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, many thanks to the organizers, uh, Paolo, Vittoria, and you, Mauro, for uh, this uh, this uh, meeting. Many thanks uh, also to the president of uh, International Association of Geomorphologists for. Uh, his uh, warm uh, uh, welcome and his comments for uh, this uh, multiplier event and for uh, this uh, project. I will now try to share my my screen and uh, let me see. You see the presentation now? Yes, yes, it's fine. No. We see your screen, yes, if you could. But I don't hear you anymore. I don't know why. Can, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, it is visible. It is visible. It's visible. Yes. I mean, it's something is not working. This is the problem with the team. Problem with team. Because of team. Uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Could see your screen before. Uh, I don't know. You see my screen? No. No, it's black. Mm. Let me try again. I'm sorry for that. Okay, you can see your screen. Your screen. 
You see my screen. Mm -hmm. Not the presentation, Not the presentation. but the team yeah. screen. Yes, no. I, I noticed that. Okay, okay. Oh, now it's visible. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Remind us. Thank you. <laughs> and you see the slides changing. Is that right? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, I will uh, present um, to the whole uh, group, uh, to all participants here, and thank you for being with us, our uh, GOVT project. GOVT stands for Training uh, New Generations on Geomorphology, Geohazards and Geoheritage through Virtual Reality Technologies. And it aims to give all uh, students, because uh, this is our target uh, group, uh, university students, the opportunity to get to know various geomorphic environments which are inaccessible or unavailable in their country or uh, require uh, time and money to visit. The idea was born during uh, the pandemic, as Mauro mentioned, but later, uh, later on, we thought that it would be wonderful to establish a connection between the geomorphologists and share our uh, uh, field trips in our amphitheaters, even uh, without uh, the pan pandemic. With this way, our students will visit more sites and will learn about them from those who are doing uh, research in these uh, areas. So the GOVT journey started like that, but it is not only uh, this. Let's uh, introduce, uh, first of all, uh, the GOVT team. Um, there are six universities in total collaborate on this project, and specifically University of Stockholm as a leader of uh, the project, uh, my university, National and Cambodian University of Athens, University of uh, Modena, uh, um, which is uh, uh, running uh, this uh, wonderful event uh, today, University of Caen uh, Normandy from uh, France, University of uh, uh, Rock, Rock, Roxley, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, from Poland. And uh, all these partners from these universities are all dealing with uh, geomorphology. We have one more university, um, the University of Aspete uh, from Greece, who is taking care of the pedagogical part of uh, this project since we propose new, new tools in education. And last but not the least, we have a private uh, IT company in our uh, group. It is Omeka company, which is the one who, uh, who developed the tool we use for our um, field trips. You will have the chance later on to, to hear about these uh, tools uh, from our colleagues from uh, Omega. So, GOVT offer alternative forms of education to contribute to a fundamental uh, change in teaching methods in uh, multiple domains in science, offer participants the ability to virtual, virtually navigate over areas which uh, they could not visit otherwise, to enrich students' experience and provide deeper learning opportunities by bringing to life lessons on geomorphology, geohazards and geoheritage uh, cases. Uh, but GOVT uh, is not only the virtual field trips in geomorphology. GOVT provides new educational material for geomorphology, geohazards and geoheritage. Uh, of course, uh, the, uh, it provides various geomorphic uh, virtual field trips, as I mentioned before. It provides authoring tool for creating custom virtual reality interactive presentation. So after the end of, of uh, this project, um, not only the partnership, but colleagues uh, outside the partnership may create their own virtual field trips. It provides an open e-class, um, a course, Geomorphology, Geohazards and Geoheritage. As I mentioned, it is open, open, 
to the whole geomorphic uh, uh, society uh, and it is open for colleagues outside the partnership not only to use but also to to join and um, and uh, add its own um, uh, uh, media and uh, also uh, any book um, under the title geomorphology geohazard and geoheritage in virtual uh, uh, reality uh, the four first um, uh, bullets uh, um, in this uh, slide is uh, already uh, done so it's it's ready you may visit you may join us and now we are working on uh, on the last one on this this ebook um, as i mentioned uh, the target is uh, to have different geomorphic environment because uh, each one each of us in uh, our country we have uh, some uh, uh, specific and uh, some other no so it is important that uh, we feed our um, our students with uh, uh, knowledge from different geomorphic uh, environments and this is what we are trying to do so each of the partner in uh, this um, in this uh, project provides a different geomorphic uh, environment uh, based to our knowledge and our experience and our uh, uh, research here um, I can um, show you just a sample of what um, we may develop through the, the GeoVT tool using uh, uh, three, uh, 360 photos collected from uh, the field along with additional material. Uh, our colleagues later on uh, will share with you what uh, we have done so far and the virtual field trips we have uh, prepared uh, through uh, GeoVT and uh, which are ready to be used not only to our amphitheaters but uh, in uh, the geomorphological uh, community worldwide. Our open e-class is a very powerful uh, future tool which uh, concentrates lectures, educational material, vi virtual field trips of digital morphic environments in uh, one place. It's fully implemented uh, educational multimedia material, scientific journals, uh, e-exercises, and uh, even um, exams, uh, questions uh, out of uh, of uh, this uh, material in uh, in uh, in um, given in a funny and playable uh, way uh, thanks uh, to uh, Aspet and to our uh, colleague uh, uh, Psycharis. Um, the e-class could be a common tool for geomorphologists from different universities to share their classes and their material, and also students from different universities to interact and uh, to work together. This uh, tool is uh, already prepared, is uh, there. Please feel free to, to join, to use it. And uh, we will be more than happy if um, not only uh, use it, but uh, you, you really join, you add your material, you share this uh, in uh, your uh, class and be, be part of uh, this uh, GeoVT. Um, we, we will uh, run also an uh, e-training uh, school providing uh, comprehensive uh, education on uh, applied geomorphology topics and there are links to society, geohazard assessment and management and geoheritage issues through virtual reality and 3D animation. Uh, this is something um, um, that uh, is expected uh, to come and we, we will be really glad if uh, you take uh, part to this if, if you are a student, uh, but also if you are a, a tutor, please uh, jo join and um, we will be happy to have you uh, there. Uh, there are many different ways uh, to follow us and to learn more of uh, our uh, activities, what uh, we are uh, doing uh, um, in uh, this um, um, this uh, GeoVT because more uh, more are coming. So whatever uh, um, media you use, you will you may find find us there. there Facebook, uh, TikTok, uh, uh, YouTube. Um, uh, you may see the different uh, ways and uh, different uh, media that uh, you may find uh, news about uh, GeoVT and. Um,
project? And uh, at this point, um, and before I, I give the floor to the next speakers of our uh, Geovitech group to present you some of the virtual free trips that uh, we have developed, I would like to close my presentation with a video of how our students feel and how they see GeoVT. So let's see GeoVT in, uh, let's say, in one minute through their uh, own uh, eyes. Thank you for your attention. I hope um, um, I, I also share my sound. If not, because a student is talking, please let me know and I will try to share it once again. The project Geomorphological Virtual Field Trips is designed to demonstrate a uniform and integrated teaching guideline that promotes distance education by utilizing the most recent trend of technologies in education. The aim of the project is to offer alternative forms of education, contributing to a fundamental change in teaching methods in multiple disciplines of science. Students will gain experience through the interactive aspect of geomorphology, geohazards and geoheritage, subjects which come to life with students are virtually in the field. GeoVT is training new generations on geomorphology, geohazards and geoheritage through virtual reality technologies. Join us and explore field trips on various geomorphological sites around Europe and get the virtual reality experience. So, thank you very much for your, your attention and um, I hope you will uh, enjoy the virtual field trips that the rest of colleagues will uh, share with you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much, Nikki. So the opening uh, is uh, is concluded now and uh, now we start uh, with uh, the main part of the webinar and in its first part we have invited talks uh, from the project partner institutions and then in the second part uh, we will have invited talks from external scientists who will bring experience on similar topics but from a different perspective. So now I pass uh, the torch to Paola Corazza uh, from our university, the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia, uh, to, to lead this session uh, uh, regarding invited uh, talks and she will chair it. So please, uh, Paola, the, chair, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And again, thank you very much to be um, with us. Uh, so I'm, I should not take uh, uh, any, uh, any more time and I will invite the first um, presenter, the first speaker uh, to, um, to talk about teaching heritage values through virtual uh, reality. So I, um, um, Victoria, you have uh, 12 minutes of, for your presentation and uh, then we can have um, time for one more, uh, one short question. And um, um, please, uh, the audience take into account the fact that we have uh, the chat. So if you want to uh, make any question, just feel free to um, write it on the chat. Please, Vittoria. Thank you very much. Are you able to see my presentation now? Yes. OK, good. So I will start. Thank you for the presentation, Paola. My talk today uh, is for providing you with some ideas to illustrate um, procedures for creating engaging lessons using virtual reality concerning geoheritage definitions and values. But first of all, why geoheritage? For people who are not familiar with the term geoheritage, geoheritage is a part of the global natural heritage, including special places, elements, landscapes that are able to uh, increase our understanding of the history of the Earth. Um, Geoheritage, for example, through geotourism, can promote the conservation of geodiversity. Geoheritage can be also used for educational purposes to provide students with knowledge about Earth history and processes shaping the landscape. 
Um, in the last few years, uh, dedicated courses and contents regarding geoheritage and geodiversity have been introduced in uh, university. However, there is still the need to improve the awareness regarding these topics, especially at higher level of education, such as universities. Uh, why, you may guess, uh, we can uh, we would like to integrate uh, virtual reality uh, together with geo heritage outreach well there are several examples in literature regarding the use of immersive technology in the field of geoscience and in particular geo heritage um, as you may guess, uh, there, there are some advantages in the use of virtual technologies, uh, for example, in exploring geo sites, uh, geo heritage sites. First of all, um, it will uh, allow to overcome the inaccessibility of those places. Uh, moreover, uh, to preserve the integrity of particularly vulnerable sites. And moreover, to avoid the visitors and students to be threatened by geological hazards. In this context, uh, we developed uh, a virtual reality based lesson uh, using this workflow uh, made up uh, of five steps. Um, I, I will um, go fast uh, regarding this slide because I'm going to describe more in detail each of the five steps we followed. Uh, please um, consider these steps as an outline, uh, not only specific to our uh, virtual reality lessons that we implemented in relation to this project, but also as a general outline that can be followed also by beginners, non-experts uh, in virtual reality technologies as uh, I am. Um, so the first part, uh, uh, the first step uh, was to identify uh, academic programs uh, in which the virtual reality lesson uh, can be, uh, could be included. The programs uh, specifically refers to earth natural sciences, uh, environmental sciences and geography. Uh, each of these programs, uh, including, uh, for example, uh, courses, bachelor's and master's degrees, uh, with courses on virtual reality lesson, of course, can be also uh, provided, can be also part of dedicated courses on geoheritage and geoconservation. Um, what is the objective of our lesson? Uh, it is important uh, as our second step to identify the objective of the lesson, of course. In our case, uh, our aim was to provide students with theoretical and practical knowledge on concepts and methods for studying geoheritage. The contents of our lessons um, were uh, in includes geoheritage definitions, uh, geomorphological heritage and its features, and geoheritage values, uh, namely scientific, historic, aesthetic and ecological values. Of course, after the lessons, um, we want to provide students with a final test to verify the effectiveness, the effectiveness of the learning experience that we implemented. Uh, we believe that immersive virtual field trips uh, can be a valuable tool in order to um, educate to geoscience and to promote geoheritage. So we decided uh, in the frame of the project to create immersive, immersive virtual field trips. The immersive virtual field trips uh, were also integrated with the bibliographic material and lectures by means of standard presentation like PowerPoint, for example. Um, the virtual field trips uh, were uh, um, developed within specific places that uh, we selected according to their representativeness. Um, the first uh, two study sites uh, were located in Italy, in the Emilia Apennines. The first one uh, was located in the Natural Reserve of Salse di Nirano, where mud cones, uh, um, mud volcanoes uh, developed. The other site is located in the footies of the Northern Apennine as well, and is characterized by uh, uh, beautiful landscape morphology with some erosional selective features. 
The third site uh, was not in Italy, but in Maltese Islands, uh, and in particular in the northern part of the of Malta Island in Paradise Bay, uh, where a beautiful uh, uh, lateral spreading phenomena uh, together with rock topples occurred. Uh, close to this locality, also um, a very nice sinkhole, uh, quite extensive one, was included within the field trip. Um, once decide, uh, once uh, set the um, outline, general outline of our lessons, we started to collect and prepare the material for uh, the educational purposes. Uh, we collected existing material, including uh, bibliography, photographs, uh, drone videos, uh, also 3D objects, for example, like digital elevation models. Uh, we prepared the explanatory materials, including uh, textual explanations based on our knowledge of the area and on relevant literature. Then we converted, in order to implement the virtual field trips, we converted this textual explanation into speech using free online tools. You may find an example uh, of this. Uh, uh, of, uh, of this online free tool to convert text to speech here in the slide, but there are many other options. Uh, at the same time, we collected and prepared uh, multimedia materials, including 360 photographs and videos, uh, standard photographs and sound recording. Regarding this uh, last step, for the collection of the 360 videos and photographs, we used a uh, camera, the Insta360. You can find it, uh, you can uh, see it uh, in the left corner of this slide, and you can use it uh, and control it by using a normal smartphone. For the preparation, we used a dedicated software, the Insta360 Studio software. Uh, to export uh, all the multimedia material in uh, JPEG for the JPG format for 360 photos and MP4 format for 360 videos. Here, an example of a 360 video um, collected in correspondence of the Maltese sinkhole that I showed before. With the pointer, with the mouse, you can um, drag uh, and uh, see and explore all the uh, sinkhole. Um, Okay, so after collecting all the material, after prepare all the uh, all the textual and explanatory material, we are ready to prepare to implement the, the virtual reality lesson, the virtual immersive field trip. Uh, we followed in particular two steps. First one, we upload the material uh, using the GOVT authoring tool. Second, we create a virtual reality lesson uh, by putting together all the material using the GOVT platform. I will describe very briefly uh, these two uh, final steps because uh, later on, Omega Tech, uh, one of the partners of, of the project, will explain it more in detail since um, he was uh, uh, the uh, developer of such platforms. Just to uh, give you a brief uh, uh, overview, uh, this is the Joe um, uh, VT online authoring tool where you can uh, create your project. Each project corresponds to a virtual itinerary. Then, in correspondence of each project, uh, the materials uh, was the materials related to each of the virtual field trip was included inside, as you can see briefly in this uh, sketch. Then the virtual reality lesson was finally assembled using the JVT platform. You can see a, um, a screenshot of the uh, JVT uh, platform. Uh, now I would like to show you uh, a video um, in order to um, illustrate an example of a virtual reality based lesson. Uh, please uh, consider that the video that I am going to show to you is uh, uh, adapted in order to um, be shown during this presentation. So not all the features that uh, I, are you going to see in the um, you are going to see in the video are explained properly because of time reasons. So, 
I would like also to mention that the lessons, uh, the virtual reality itineraries can be also viewed through virtual reality headset by using dedicated JVT player, as we see, as we saw in the promotional video at the beginning of the uh, of the of the of the day. Uh, OK, so let the video start. Just one moment. Nestled in the enchanting landscape of the northern Apennines, the Salsedi Nerano emerges as a prime example of a geosite brimming with diverse values. The so-called Salsedi Nerano are the result of muddy emissions caused by the upward movement to the surface of saltwater mixed with mud and hydrocarbons along fractures in the ground. The Salsedi Nerano Natural Reserve was among the first protected areas identified and protected in Italy. Now we are in one of the visitor centers located within the Salsedi Nerano Reserve, a 19th century rural complex classified as a building of significant historical, architectural, cultural, and testimonial value. Nowadays, it not only serves as the home of an eco museum, but also provides recreational facilities for visitors. Furthermore, associations dedicated to scientific outreach and environmental education regularly organize events for both children and adults every week. From a socio-economic perspective, the Salsedi Nerano holds great attraction as a tourist destination with its bubbling mud volcanoes. Local communities also benefit from the tourism influx, as it fosters economic growth and opportunities for sustainable development. In addition to its socio-economic value, the Salsedi Nerano stands as a historical value. In fact, many historical sources testify that the Nerano area, since ancient times, was a dwelling place of organized groups. In the past, many naturalists and travelers visited the Salsedi Nerano, contributing to create an important documentation on their evolution. The Salse has a great ecological value providing the unique habitat, and only plant species adapted to salty conditions can survive near the mud cones. OK, so um, I hope that I was able to show you the potential of the virtual field trips for education in GeoHeritage and that uh, um, also uh, that beginners and people that are new to virtual reality technologies uh, can be able to um, provide to create their own virtual reality based lessons using the GeoVT tools. So, Thank you very much for your attention. Um, if you have uh, questions or uh, curiosities, please do not hesitate to ask to me in the chat or even uh, with your voice. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vittoria. We have time for uh, just a short question. Um, in the chat, um, they ask if we can provide, share the link to the e-training platform, maybe um Nikki or the colleagues from the um National and Capo District University can help us to uh, answer to this question. Yes, yes, I will uh, write down, I will give okay. the I will provide the link. Okay, thank you very much, Nikki. So um we can now uh, move on the next uh, presentation and uh, if someone wants to uh, have some curiosity or um, um, have question for Victoria can just uh, write on uh, it on uh, on the chat. So I invite now the uh, next presenter that is uh, Janice uh, um, Saitis from the National Capodistrian uh, University. Janice, you can share your uh, screen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paula and uh, Victoria and Professor Soldati uh, for the today uh, uh, event. Um, yes, let me try okay great screen. yes perfect thank you so, the floor is yours thank you very much okay so first of all uh, i would like to thank uh, also vittoria about uh, the introduction of uh, the methodology 
on how uh, we study uh, first um, the geo environment and then put it in uh, the virtual uh, tool. Um, this methodology is also common uh, for the rest of uh, the virtual field trips. So uh, my presentation is about how uh, in um, our project uh, we incorporated uh, the um, uh, uh, teaching of uh, coastal zone uh, processes and, and the geomorphology of uh, coastal zone in uh, the virtual um, uh, field trips. So uh, first of all, uh, we all know the direct way how to teach uh, coastal geomorphology. Um, the best way is uh, to go to the beach and talk with the students, uh, have uh, interact uh, uh, interaction with them, raise questions, and uh, make the students see uh, the, uh, the coastal zone with different eyes. And sometimes you can achieve that also uh, with the tourists. Uh, however, uh, during uh, uh, the period that uh, we're running right now, it's sometimes very, very difficult to uh, reach the coast um, and uh, work uh, with uh, our students. So uh, we have developed uh, these virtual uh, field works as a very uh, important and complementary teaching tool uh, for the cost of geomorphology. And don't forget that sometimes it's very exp expensive to uh, move so many people to the coast and uh, uh, work also. So these technologies are very are very convenient. Uh, so in uh, our project, we have developed two different uh, virtual uh, fieldworks uh, concerning the coastal zone. The first one is the sea level changes uh, that takes place in uh, Naxos Island, and the second one uh, concerns the coastal erosion uh, that takes place in three different uh, places: uh, the Marathonas. Um, uh, Milos, there's a typo, uh, Milos of uh, uh, Northern uh, Avia Island and Diolkos at Corinth. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to mention that every each of our uh, uh, virtual fieldworks, uh, they are um, they're having uh, an um, uh, educational material uh, so uh, in our uh, e-class, as I mentioned before from Professor Abelpido, uh, we have all our material there, text, presentations, and uh, uh, exercises uh, also. So uh, in sea level changes, uh, we, uh, our uh, target is uh, to make students to understand what are uh, the sea level changes, uh, the fluctuation of uh, the water, uh, how uh, the, shore, the shoreline retreats and what kind of indicators mainly we do have that uh, show uh, this uh, information to us, uh, scientists. And um, also we are trying um, to, 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 to learn the students about uh, the gorge and the relative sea level uh, changes. So uh, in order uh, for doing that, uh, we're using uh, and talking about the sea level indicators uh, we introduced the biological, the archaeological, the geomorphological, and the sedimentological indicators. Um, uh, so by pointing out the biological indicators um, and uh, how important they are in order to understand the sea level fluctuations, their limits, uh, their, uh, the range of uh, the organisms, uh, for uh, for these indicators, and uh, for the geomorphological indicators, we are talking about uh, beach rocks uh, as uh, fossilized uh, beaches, uh, past beaches, uh, about marine terraces, marine and marine notches. For uh, the archaeological indicators, uh, were very uh, special and important, uh, mainly in uh, the Mediterranean uh, zone. Um, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, the harbors, uh, uh, other coastal settlements, and uh, how these are um, are very important for as indicators for the sea level fluctuations here in local and uh, worldwide also uh, level. And uh, finally, we're talking about uh, the sedimentological indicators, about sediments, sediment traps, uh, how uh, these are uh, formed, 
how we study them and what kind of information we retrieve from these about the sea level uh, changes. So um, in our project, having all this uh, material combined, uh, we point out uh, that there is a special uh, area uh, combining most of these uh, information, and this is the Naxos Island. So uh, we went to Naxos and using um, 360 photos as Vittoria showed you before with the same methodology and combining also drone photos. Um, we, uh, we had uh, in mind uh, to show uh, most of uh, the coastal uh, morphologies and uh, the different uh, landscapes, how um, the, uh, these landscapes uh, were uh, developed. Um, we also um, saw uh, how uh, beach rocks, and we're talking about beach rocks, how they were developed, and this, there's their special uh, contribution uh, to these uh, coastal uh, zones. Uh, and also, uh, we're talking about uh, paleo shorelines. Furthermore, uh, we are having many lagoons um, interpreted with uh, 360 photos. So we're talking about the sedimentary processes and uh, the information that derived from cores uh, from the, and uh, other studies from uh, these um, lagoons. And um, also Naxos is very well known about the extensive dune fields. So we have a lot of um, data and 360 photos and information about uh, the dunes and their importance to the coastal zone. Uh, the second um, uh, aspect that uh, we're having on our uh, coastal zone uh, teaching in our project uh, is the coastal erosion, uh, which is uh, something that is very familiar also in different uh, areas uh, around the uh, Mediterranean coastal, Mediter uh, coastal areas. Uh, so in order to show um, uh, 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 about uh, the coastal erosion during our teaching uh, process. Uh, we wanted to uh, talk about uh, the number of uh, sediment uh, that is lost um, in uh, uh, a specific uh, area. Uh, also, we're talking about uh, the parameters defining the coastal uh, erosion, uh, like uh, the climate, the wave regime, uh, the coastal uh, currents, the lithology of the, these coastal uh, regions and the global sea level rise in general. Also, uh, after understanding the main factors of the coastal erosion, we're dealing with uh, the study and the, met uh, with the, and the methods uh, to study um, uh, the coastal erosion and uh, many uh, different practices. And along all these uh, coastal constructions and the human activities in order to prevent uh, coastal erosion, hard uh, engineering methods, soft engineering methods, and etc. Uh, so these are uh, what our material contains. And in order to provide this uh, information and put them in a virtual uh, field trip, we had to uh, go around to three different areas. So uh, we went to uh, Marathonas coastal zone, uh, also in uh, Milos, uh, at the uh, Northern Avia and uh, the Old Coast area in Corinth. So again, uh, we used uh, 360 photos and drones of, uh, from its uh, drone photos from its uh, case. Uh, as you see here in this photo, uh, we see the today um, uh, image of uh, the Old Coast and um, I will, uh, I will talk about that uh, later. So first of all, uh, we went to Marathonas. Marathonas is a very important uh, case about uh, coastal erosion as um, the, uh, there we're dealing with uh, sediment shortage uh, coming, uh, coming to uh, the coast because of uh, the Marathon Dam, uh, which is uh, one uh, of the biggest dam th that we have in uh, Attica. Uh, for uh, for our water in Athens also. So there are many human activities in Marathon uh, coastal zone 
and um, it's very important and what, what uh, where uh, we want to the students uh, to teach from here uh, that um, having a sediment shortage may cause um, uh, distractions uh, in the coastal zone. We see here uh, many Abaddon, uh, Abaddon uh, houses and uh, coastal uh, postals that in the past were very uh, active, but uh, today uh, they're uh, damaged and uh, from uh, coastal erosion and the sediment uh, uh, movement. Then uh, we're going, uh, we went to the Mili uh, uh, of Northern Avia, uh, where there we, um, ha we show about, and we talk about uh, the coastal uh, landslides. So uh, in uh, 8th of, 8th of uh, June uh, this year, there was a 4.8 Richter uh, earthquake, and uh, there was a coastal landslide where uh, after after the landslide, the slope that was uh, created um, here uh, on the beach uh, had 50 uh, degrees, uh, 50 50 percent of uh, slope. So it was a very steep one. A lot of uh, sediment was uh, transferred in the uh, the depth of uh, the sea. Uh, also, uh, the material that uh, was left here uh, was glue, uh, loose clayly um, uh, sediment, and uh, we found out that most of that uh, material uh, was mixed with uh, organic material, and this may was one factor uh, dealing with um, uh, this coastal uh, landslide. So this is something very important and very special uh, that. Uh, we have included in our virtual field trip. And uh, finally, um, the third uh, site is the Dilk of Okori, which is a very special also site as we have archaeological and ge uh, geoheritage uh, interest, uh, which, uh, was, which is under erosion. So you see here from uh, drone photos, uh, this is uh, the Dilko's um, sl sl uh, slide path, uh, where in the past, in the 7th century BC, uh, in Greece, uh, boats were traveling on that uh, uh, slide path, uh, slipway, excuse me, slipway, uh, from the Corinth Canal uh, towards to the Aegean Sea, from the Union to the, uh, to the Aegean Sea. Uh, so it was a very important um, construction in the past. So you see here, uh, it was eroded uh, from um, small waves uh, by the boats uh, coming and passing through the canal, uh, the Corinth Canal. But the today uh, uh, view is like that. Uh, so um, in this um, virtual field trip, we're dealing about um the heavy uh, constructions uh, in order to protect maybe uh these uh, very special uh, areas uh, all these constructions uh, they are creating uh, from uh, they're created from cement there is no any uh, natural protection and they are fully altering the environment as you see here all this area is going to be covered by cement and uh, later on, they're, they're going to uh, put the Diolcos on top of cement. Uh, also, we're dealing about the beach of destruction. It is very special because um, a, a, a beach rock was formed uh, at that time where Diolcos uh, was also constructed. And um, this special geoheritage um, and geomorphological uh, feature is going to be covered by cement and partly destroyed. You see here how they're using it in order to create uh, cement uh, constructions. And um, we're dealing about the potential increase of the coastal erosion and the infrastructure damages about what they're going to create on this specific area. So. Thank you very much for your attention and don't forget to follow us to our main uh, social media uh, pages and um, the main uh, web page of the project. Thank you very much.
thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis, for your presentation, your nice, very nice uh, presentation. We have uh, um, time uh, for um, a short question. Um, yes, let's see. Are there methodological constraints to using virtual reality to study coastal system, especially tidal times? Um, this is a very uh, interesting uh, question. Uh, well, um, you will have to take uh, in account uh, the tide, of course, where you want to um, interpret this information in your virtual uh, field trips. Uh, for example, in Greece, we don't have so high tide, but um, uh, if you want to see this the kind of differences, I would propose to um, to have, um, uh, let's say, to interpret the area, the coastal zone before at the low tide and uh, on the high tide, if this is very, if this is important on um, the coastal uh, procedures taking place in this specific area. Okay, maybe the, the you can continue to discuss on, uh, on chat about uh, this and now we can uh, move on the next uh, for the next uh, to the next presentation. Um, Paola, yes. Uh, uh, just a question. Um, I am trying to to upload the PDF with the instructions for uh, the um, open class, but okay. um, I cannot do it in the chat. Do you have another way? Because only the link it will not help uh, our colleagues to to join. Okay, we can try. Um, yes. Sir. I can try. Uh, OK, Vittoria can try to manage this. To OK, manage this. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I don't know if uh, uh, Ilva um, said that she has some uh, having troubles with the, um, her laptop, so maybe we can uh, move directly to the um, presentation given by the University of Caen. Um, so uh, I invite uh, Candide. And uh, Mohand, Mohand, sorry for my pronunciation, <laughs> to give the uh, talk. Okay. Hello. Hello. Can you share your screen? Yes. I was going to Is something, can you say something? No, uh, no, not yet, no. Okay, sorry. Uh, fenêtre. Yes, now it's okay. We can see your screen. Uh, which part? Because I can see. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> the, the, the presentation, so maybe you can uh, put on the uh, presentation. Yes, okay. Is it okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, um, thank you very much. Uh, so, I will present the, um, our participation from uh, Caen University in the in the project, and uh, we will focus today of uh, a part of our contribution, which is uh, um, the the study of uh, uh, of coastal erosion in uh, in Normandy. And how we use it for the for the for the lesson. So, just to understand, we will focus uh, here on various kind of coast uh, area. For example, uh, with uh, in, in the northern part of uh, Normandy, we have more cliff and uh, fall, uh, which are very interesting to understand uh, the erosion of processes. But we also uh, will focus our uh, contribution on the landslide er erosion um, in coastal area. For example, here in the in the in the fall uh, in the cliff area, but also in slope uh, coastal slope area. For example, here we have the the Villerville landslide. Um, and we will propose uh, a virtual field trip of this area because it is very specific 
with, uh, with uh, particularly interesting processes. And we will propose also a virtual field trip of the Vachnoir landslide. Uh, the both landslide, the both area are, are investigated by our, our team since several years. And uh, we have a lot of uh, data and measurements in this area. That's why we use it for the project. So I will show you now the, the field trip. Uh, I, I try to escape, maybe. Oh. Can you see the, the camera, the, the virtual? Yes, virtual? yes, we yes. can see. OK. OK, OK. So this is an example of what we can uh, we can uh, propose here. So we had uh, a virtual field trip of the Vache Noir landslide, and we, we begin our visit on the, on the foreshore, on the beach, and we progressively, uh, gradually, we can, we can uh, climb on the, on the landslide, and we had some information. For example, we will begin our, our uh, virtual field trip uh, with explanation of the Normandy uh, context, uh, geological part for sure, but also uh, the role of the sea erosion, the role of uh, the the rainfall uh, um, on the landslide activity, uh, some parameters like that, and we will have some illustrations. Sorry, so illustration to uh, give more information. For example. Uh, we will begin our presentation with a, a global description of the of the landslide, uh, with ma uh, with main uh, morphological uh, elements, for example, crests, uh, gullies, scarp, etc. Gradually, we can climb and move on the landslide, and we had also various pictures of, for example, here what kind of material is affected by landsliding, uh, and uh, we can also give some example of um, uh, ge ge geological or geotechnical test measurement we, that we have done in our laboratory. We can move on the landslide, as you can see here. Uh, so we can also discuss about the coastal erosion uh, management that we have uh, in this area and make some, give some information about the morphology of the, of the landslide, for sure. Uh, we will see different kind of elements in the, in the landscape. We will focus on the mud flow, for example, here, and, uh, and the gully with other elements about geological layers and the ge geological parameters in this area to understand how the landslide occur, how uh, what what's the role of the rain of, of the of the rain of the groundwater, etc., with various kind of illustration, as we can see here, and we can provide an um, an automatic uh, recording of uh, of this of this uh, element information. Sorry. OK. Mohan, je te laisse la main. We can we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Now you can hear me. Yes. Yes. <laughs> sorry. So if you can go back to the PowerPoint presentation, just yes. for a few words to conclude by saying that uh, uh, in the next slide, yes. Uh, of course, like uh, precedent uh, presentations, we uh, this virtual reality work is also intended to draw attention to the scientific work and post-processing of monitoring measurements carried out uh, on these sites. As you can see, see uh, for example, uh, with uh, three, uh, 3D modeling uh, carried out by uh, structure from motion uh, uh, drone photogrammetry or uh, terrestrial laser scanning, etc. 
And if you can show the next, yes. Um, in this way, we can lead the students to uh, the open e-class courses that respond to uh, this virtual experience in the field um, by showing uh, the results of 3D modeling of these particular landforms and by showing how these landforms have changed over time. As you can see here, um, these geomorphological study sets have been monitored for a long time so that we can show cycles and recurrences in the evolutions of erosions and accumulation processes. And then uh, ultimately, uh, we hope to lead to a better understandings of the processes that generate this um, particular landscape uh, forms. So here, with uh, some uh, analysis conduct in GIS or in other uh, analysis platforms. So it was, uh, uh, so, so it's important for this uh, uh, project to uh, connect all these elements, the virtual field trips, the, uh, field trips that is very important to connect to the other part of the scientific world and uh, make sense of all that for all the students that uh, are interested in these uh, questions. So uh, thank you for uh, your attention, and if you have any questions, Candide and I will be happy to, to answer them. Thanks. <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, we have time, uh, yes, for a, a question. Uh, yes, please. I don't know if I activate the microphone. OK, yes. No? Victoria, can you help me? <laughs> okay, the microphone appears as activated. Uh, okay. Maybe the guest can uh, switch on, uh, turn on the, the microphone on, uh, on his own. So. Can you hear us, Sochi? OK, maybe you can write the, your question on, uh, on the chat and then uh, the, the colleagues uh, can, uh, um, can answer to your question. We can uh, now move on because uh, uh, we, we don't have enough time. And so I ask now to uh, Hilva, uh, have you? manage the, the problem with your uh, laptop? Uh, yes, we'll see. So my the computer I was going to use died, and so I'm on another computer, and I can't get the video to turn on, so you will not get to see my face today. Uh, and we'll see if things work from this computer, because I'm not very accustomed to it. OK. Um, so, so can you share your screen yes, with we'll us? see if I can do that. OK, uh, thank you very much. Do you see my screen now? Yes, perfectly. Very good. Perfect. Thank you. The uh, floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Um, so hello, everyone. It's really nice to see that so many people are here today. Uh, and um, today uh, I will be talking about one of the topics that we at um, Stockholm University are covering within our uh, GOVT virtual reality excursions. And um, the topic that I will be talking about today is uh, ice dammed lakes and uh, the bursting of um, ice dams and the flooding that happens when these dams burst. And uh, I will do that today by first just shortly introducing the topic to you here in this PowerPoint, and then we will move on and I will give you a preview excursion uh, uh, of um, uh, from the GOVT project where uh, you will see a, a lake that was once ice dammed in central Scandinavia. But I think we should maybe just begin by defining an ice dammed lake. So an ice dammed lake is a lake that is dammed by either an ice sheet or a glacier, uh, the way you can see in the figure here. Uh, and uh, when we have these ice dams and when we have melting and deglaciation of uh, glaciers and ice sheets, these dams become less and less stable and eventually they might fail, which might lead to catastrophic releases of water from these ice dammed lakes. Um, and this is something that we might refer to as glacial lake outburst floods. 
which is a sudden release of water from an ice or moraine dammed lake. Um, and these kinds of events are expected to uh, increase uh, within the near future as a result of the global warming that we are currently experiencing. Uh, and uh, because the rising temperatures that we have will lead to increased melting of many glaciers and more meltwater production expansion of uh, glacial lakes uh, and then also destabilization of um, ice dams. Uh, and this is of course an issue to uh, many people because anyone who lives uh, downstream of an ice dam lake is then threatened by these outburst floods. And it has actually been estimated that, that around 15 million people worldwide live uh, in areas where they are exposed to the threats of outburst floods. Uh, meaning that they live close to the lakes and close to the runout paths of uh, outburst floods. And uh, most of these people, they live in high mountain Asia, so for example in the Himalayas, uh, but many also live in the Andes in South America, but these kinds of things may happen wherever we have glaciers and ice sheets. And uh, one way of studying these, um, uh, this geohazard um, of uh, glacial lake outburst floods is to look into the past, which we will be doing in the excursion that you will soon be seeing. Uh, and we can look for, for example, for geomorphological evidence of past outburst floods having happened. And in this figure here, you can see maybe four of the main evidences that we might look for. We might look for, for example, for um, uh, raised shorelines or shoreline terraces that might surround the valley uh, or um, a lake. And these indicate to us that a lake surface has been higher than it is at the present. So the valley has probably been dammed. Uh, we might look for um, uh, pronounced channels or trenches like this here, uh, where we, um, uh, which form close to the breached dam when loads of water is pouring out of the lake. We might look for devastated riverbeds uh, where we have uh, much bedrock cropping out and large boulders um, that indicate to us that large amounts of water have flown through here and uh, removed other material uh, of larger grain size and so on. And we might also look for debris fans and deltas and other kinds of uh, features that might tell us that uh, we have had um, high energy water flowing uh, and removing uh, and transporting uh, material. But now that we've had this short introduction, I will move on and talk about the specific uh, area that we will visit in the excursion that you will soon get to see. And um, that is Lake Grövelsjön. Uh, which lies in central Scandinavia, a lake in central Scandinavia, uh, on the border between uh, Sweden and Norway. And here, during the last uh, deglaciation of Scandinavia, which happened during at the end of the last ice age, around 10,000 years ago, uh, this lake was dammed by the uh, Scandinavian ice sheet, as you can see in the figure here, uh, by the ice, uh, ice sheet that was retreating towards the southeast here. And here we have the Grövelsjön Valley that you, as you can see, is dammed by the ice. And as this um, ice sheet was retreating uh, in the landscape, Lake Grövelsjön experienced multiple um, outburst floods, um, which we will see evidence of in the excursion. Uh, and I will now move to this window and show you, can you see the excursion? Yes, so we can see. Perfect. So we are now standing on the shore of modern day Lake Gravelchen. We're standing on the southern shore, as you can see here. And uh, well, this is the lake that then was ice dammed during the last uh, deglaciation. Uh, and this lake is at the moment uh, at its deepest, 34 meters deep, and uh, covers a little more than four square kilometers. But during the last the glaciation and during the damming, this lake was far larger, as you will come to see. And so the next stop we're making is up here on Longfjellet Mountain, which lies south uh, northeast of uh, where we were standing uh, before. And here down is um, Lake Grövelsjön, and we also have Grövelsjön continuing behind the hill here. And uh, what we want to see here or the shorelines that are on the sides of Lake Grövelsjön, here and here. You can't really see them as well as I would have liked to, uh, but they are 
appears straight lines on the valley sides. You have one white line here also. Uh, and here we have multiple shorelines, at least eight, I think, uh, which indicate that this lake has been dammed uh, previously to higher levels uh, and that drainage has happened in multiple events. And the highest shoreline lies at 887 meters above sea level, which is more than 120 meters above the present day lake level down here. Uh, so that's quite large amounts of water that have been here uh, extra compared to today and large amounts of water that have drained in the past. And if we move to this photo here, you can see more clearly what the shorelines look like. They are these straight uh, horizontal terraces and uh, the lines uh, in the landscape here. And we can also see the terraces in this hillshade map here. That's the lines on the sides of the Gravelsjön Valley. Um, now we move, we're moving to the next stop, uh, and here we are southwest of Lake Gravelsjön. We were up here previously, uh, and um, we're standing on one of the shorelines that we saw from before. And we have shorelines above us in the terrain and below us in the terrain. Uh, and the main thing to notice here is perhaps that it's not as easy to recognize the shorelines when you're standing on them as when you're looking at them from afar. But they are these kinds of um, more or less horizontal or gently sloping terraces that occur on um, uh, in hill slopes. And here you can see what the shorelines look like. Next stop we're making is a little west of uh, where we were last. Uh, a little more than one kilometer away from Lake Gravelsjön. Uh, and um, what we're standing by here is one of the pronounced channels that I mentioned previously that form close uh, to uh, where the dam bridge is happening when we have a, a glacial lake outburst flood. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, during one of the outburst floods from Lake Gravelsjön, uh, water escaped and carved this channel. Uh, and um, this is, can also be referred to as a, an outlet channel, a glacial lake outlet channel. And we can recognize them as uh, these kinds of dry uh, channels that are not part of the modern day drainage network. Uh, and that this one also just uh, suddenly appears from the top of the hill um, with nothing on the other side of the hill happening. So it's a strange phenomenon. Uh, and uh, the hilltop here that we have is where the dam that would... Um, have a blocked water from flowing out would have been and then it burst and then water came flowing out and carving this channel um, which is 30 to 35 meters wide uh, and this would have happened within a matter of hours or days so it's a very high energy event that we're talking about uh, but then once the uh, uh, outburst flood had happened uh, we will get new st stabilization of Lake Gravelsjön, uh, the surface of Lake Gravelsjön, uh, at the same elevation at the, as the start of this channel, because this channel becomes the new lowest point surrounding Lake Gravelsjön. And this is at 847 meters above sea level. And if we look at the sea uh, shorelines that surround Gravelsjön, there is one uh, that sits at 847 meters above sea level. And in this map here you see what that lake would have looked like uh, and you we where the blue arrow is down here is where we're standing and where water was flowing out in the outburst flood and as you can see this lake is more than twice has more than twice the area of modern day lake Gravelsjön and it's around uh, three times as deep so quite a lot larger and then we can move to this hillshade map here where we can see the outlet channel that we're standing by marked here but we can also see that in the hill slope here we have four additional channels uh, and these lie at higher elevation and they represent earlier drainages of Lake Gravelsjön through outburst floods. Uh, and now we've moved so we're standing inside of one of those outlet channels and here we can see those um, devastated riverbeds that I talked about. We have a lot of bare bedrock cropping out in this channel here and we have many large boulders that have been transported to this place uh, by the floodwaters and then deposited here, uh, which uh, again shows us the very high energy of the water that flowed through here. Uh, and this channel would have been much more bare 10,000 years ago. Now we have quite a lot of sphagnum moss and other stuff growing here. 
uh, now we're making the last stop of this mini excursion and we have traveled approximately 20 kilometers away from Grevelsjön. We're standing in Norway uh, by Lake Femunden. Uh, and uh, here we're standing actually in front of a delta. We can see the slope here that is actually the delta front of the delta that has been uh, built out into Lake Femunden. And this delta actually formed in association with the outburst floods at Grevelsjön because the water traveling in the floods from Grevelsjön uh, took this path uh, more or less uh, and then ended up in Femunden where material carried along with the waters were also deposited in this delta. And as you might recognize, uh, this delta sits above the present day lake level. We can even see the delta front above uh, the lake surface. Uh, and uh, so this is a raised delta. And the reason we have a raised delta here is because Lake Femmundum was also ice dammed at the time of the outburst floods happening uh, at Lake Grevelsjön. Uh, we actually have two uh, delta levels, as you can see in this hillshade map here, uh, which then also indicates to us that uh, Lake Femmundum was drained in multiple steps as well. So we have a kind of interesting situation here where one ice dam lake has outburst uh, floods and drains into another ice dam lake that probably also is experiencing outburst floods. Uh, and that was actually uh, all for the short mini excursion. I will move back to my presentation, show you my image sources, uh, and then I just want to finish by thanking you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, much. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your this, uh, uh, amazing, amazing virtual, virtual uh, uh, excursion. So maybe so we, we have, have a, a question. Wait, no? how, do I, how do I stop sharing? I've never used this program previously. There, thanks. Okay, let's check to the uh, chat if we have a, a question. No? Um, in in the chat you can find the uh, the link where you can uh, to which you can download the 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 document uh, in which you find all the instruction to uh, join the um, the class. So let's see, no question. So we can move on, and so I invite the next speaker, um, Sarantos. Uh, uh, Psicaris, sorry for my pronunciation. So, Sarantos, you can uh, share your screen. Well, <clears throat> okay, it's better to uh, to share the screen for Aristides Paluras because he's okay. going to present. Um, me and Aris uh, actually represent Aspete, who has the role of the pedagogical, let's say, contributor to this project. It's a higher education institute which um, educates engineering educators. Engineering. So we had so the honor to actually contribute with some serious games related to geohazards. And uh, Aris Paluras is going to uh, be more detailed about that. So uh, thank you for this excellent um, multiplayer event. And uh, Ari, the floor is yours. Thank hello, you. To, hello to all of you. Uh, <clears throat> me and uh, Sarados Psicharis, uh, we are going to present you an innovative pedagogical approach of escapes room, uh, rooms in uh, uh, Geo Heritage. Um, escapes, escape rooms are live interactive, uh, usually team-based games where players discover cues, solve puzzles, and complete tasks in one or more uh, rooms to achieve a specific goal, uh, goal usually by escaping the room. Uh, in a limited uh, amount of time. Uh, studies show that playing games in the classroom can increase overall motivation. Uh, students usually become more motivated to learn, pay attention and participate in class activities. They can also be a great classroom management tool helping to motivate a class. Uh, one important thing for you to keep in mind, a 2011 study completed by researchers in the United Kingdom found games in the classroom provided more motivation if the learning was the playful part and not just a side note to the activity. As games uh, can move quickly, a student needs to be alert and attentive for extended periods, and a study by researchers at the University of Wisconsin in Madison found games actually benefit students uh, by helping them save their attentiveness and training the brain how to learn. 
uh, using different instructional approaches in the classroom, uh, such as uh, playing games, enable students to encounter the content in various ways, making it easier for them to pay attention after the activity uh, has ended. The JOVT escape room game developed uh, is based on the concept of the escape rooms. Specifically, it consists of five missions. To complete each mission, students must work together to answer the questions asked and then discover a digit for the final secret code. Um, the game ends successfully when students discover all the digits of the final secret code. Uh, this is uh, the first uh, the first one of the game. Um, in the introduction uh, screen, we see um, the problem um, that will be solved by completing the game. Uh, for example, our planet is in danger from the collision with a huge asteroid. To avoid the collision, you must discover the secret code that will activate the R system, which uh, will destroy the asteroid. Um, the mission uh, is that uh, you have to work together to answer the questions for each mission in order to find the secret code uh, that will save our planet. There are five missions uh, that um, students need to complete to discover the secret code. The code consists of five digits. To find each uh, digit, you have to complete a mission. Um, with the help of uh, five secret agents, uh, students will discover their secret code. So, uh, here we see <coughs> the characters of the game that uh, will help us um, to, uh, to solve the, the game. Um, here we see a screen where students, um, not, in a, not serially, but uh, can uh, uh, can choose uh, uh, the destinations, and each destination uh, will give them a secret, uh, a, a digit of the final secret code. Uh, this is the um, the URL of the game. I will send it uh, to the chat uh, later. Um, here we see the mission one, the first screen of the mission one. Um, students answer a series of uh, questions to discover the first digit of the secret code. Uh, I will show you a, a sample question. Okay, take a look. And uh, after they answer a series of questions, uh, they get the students get the first number, which is the number two. Um, in a similar way, they discover the remaining digits of the code. Uh, they have to answer again a series of questions and then they get the second number of the uh, of the final secret code to unlock uh, the game. Uh, so when the students end all the missions, they complete all the missions, they will discover the secret code and they have to type uh, in this screen uh, the code that unlocks the next screen uh, uh, which uh, signifies um, the game uh, completion. Uh, <clears throat> educational escape games make the learning process fun and engaging. The objective is to increase knowledge and awareness of geoheritage through an escape game experience. Um, instead of uh, each student play uh, the game alone, we can divide um, the classroom in groups, and each group uh, can choose one destination, and finally all together, um, uh, they, they form the, the final secret code. Uh, I will send you the, the link in the chat. Thank you very much for your um, presentation that uh, arises an important question on how to uh, um, teach uh, in a different way uh, geology and uh, geomorphology. Um, we can check the uh, chat if there are some uh, questions. We have time. Okay, no questions, so we can move on. Thank you very much again 
uh, for your um, presentation. And now we have um, the uh, presentation of the University of Wroclaw. Uh, uh, Paula, sorry. Uh, I think that uh, Piotr uh, is not, not uh, joined. He's okay, not joined not... yet. So... Okay, so we we can move to the um, presentation. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just now, sorry. So, Piotr, welcome. Let's see if, if Piotr is ready to. Yeah. Hey. Hello. No, no. Did, did you did you show my presentation? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Because yes, something yes. happened and uh, no, no, it was no, no, perfect. No. Thank you very much. Um, Piotr, are you ready to to give your talk, or we can move on to the next presentation? Okay, maybe we can move the to the. Hello. Um, uh, I, uh, here. I'm here. Okay, and, thank and, you and very much, Piotr. Oh, it's okay. Thank you. So, um, you can can you share your screen and then if you are ready? Yes, I will try in a moment. Can you hear me and, yes. and can you see the, yes, the perfectly. slide? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, so may I start, Paula? Yes. Thank you. Thank you okay. very much. Uh, hello. Good morning to uh, to everyone. And um, what I'm going to uh, to show you is uh, something probably different from uh, most of you deal with, uh, but something which is uh, say adjusted to the specific environmental conditions we have in uh, Central Europe and, and related to the ability uh, to see the landscapes, to see the landforms and to uh, infer about uh, processes uh, that shape them. Um, the virtual trips are typically uh, understood as uh, following uh, like movies uh, uh, seeing the, the, the real landscapes uh, from a different perspective uh, in a full panoramic view, perhaps a little bit from the air. Uh, but uh, if your country is, uh, is mostly forest and has an extensive uh, land use and land cover, uh, that would not help. Um, so what I'm going to, to, to talk about uh, is about an alternative uh, which uh, we think is worth exploring, and this is uh, what we uh, increasingly increasingly do. Uh, so uh, let me join uh, in discovering some aspects of geomorphology uh, under forest. And these aspects are actually very relevant to the process to the project because I'm going to focus, on landslides and related phenomena, uh, which very nicely connect uh, the two main uh, themes uh, present in this uh, project, which is uh, geohazards on uh, one side and geo uh, heritage on the other one. Uh, here you, uh, I'm referring to uh, a paper uh, recently published by uh, actually participants in this project uh, where uh, the different aspects of landslides uh, are emphasized. Uh, the, the, the very recent ones, like the Vaillant slide uh, seen on the left, uh, is clearly a hazard. It, it, it caused a major disaster. Uh, whereas uh, the landslides you see on the right uh, from Scotland are from the Ice Ages and uh, can be considered as a very important part um, of geoheritage. Both, as you see uh, here, are perfect to observe from the ground level, from the panoramic viewpoints, and uh, you do not need any particular uh, enhancing tools uh, to, to, to understand them better. They are, they are shown in their 
almost full extent. Uh, however, if you come to Poland, uh, we have uh, some important challenges to teach geomorphology outdoor and to get uh, uh, students involved in landform recognition because what they see apart from okay some uh, peaks and ridges is just forest and forest and forest um, and uh, the classic uh, uh, drone flight uh, would be very applicable to forestry courses but not necessarily to geomorphology or any other geoscience courses. Uh, so whether you see the mountains from the ground perspective or if you prefer to use the Google Earth imagery, the, the picture is more or less very similar. It's just green. And, uh, and you don't really realize, um, looking at this uh, landscape, what is uh, hidden um, under the forest. Um, geological maps in the, in the particular area from which the two previous uh, photographs were taken uh, indicate that there are substantial uh, sections of slopes uh, have been affected by mass movements. Not the very recent ones, so this is not reflected in a different um, vegetation patterns. Uh, these are prehistoric lands, uh, landslides. Uh, but actually quite quite extensive. And uh, all these uh, white rectangles uh, show uh, the different uh, landslide complexes. Now, the, the upper map is an old German geological map from the beginning of this century, and the lower two panels are the most recent ones. And you see that uh, we have um, landslides shaping the slopes, shaping the valley floor, like in the upper left, uh, they may be close to one another, they may occur in isolation, and uh, the lower uh, right panel um, shows um, that uh, uh, almost the entire ridge uh, is being affected by mass movements uh, spreading in these two opposite directions. So how can we uh, make these uh, important features um, visible uh, to the um, to those interested, and particularly to to to, to our students, um, access as such is not a problem because there are no restrictions due to either land ownership or nature nature protection. Actually, we have quite a dense network of marked hiking trails. We can use forestry roads. Uh, this is all close to settlements and roads, so it's very easy to to get there. Uh, leave the car. Uh, take a walk uh, for half an hour, one hour, and you're there. Uh, but if you have a forest, these uh, landslide elements, particularly for large features, they just cannot be seen in context. And it's uh, we we notice that that's the that, that's the main problem in 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 our educational or teaching activities that the the trench, um, like you see on the upper uh, right, um, which is part of the large. Um, the lateral spreading complex um, is uh, not easy to to be related to the whole um, to the whole phenomenon. And in fact, both the the photographs on on the right uh, are taken in the part of the year where it's more suitable uh, to go in the field, uh, which is early spring, so just after the snow melted, but before all the foliage developed, which is actually quite. Uh, uh, short uh, time window. So do we have uh, means or tools uh, to overcome the problem, to make this geomorphology a little bit more lively? Well, that's uh, that's the um, digital terrain models which can be cons built uh, from uh, LiDAR, uh, LiDAR elevation data. And, uh, and the very good thing about uh, about Poland, well, perhaps one of few good things about this country, is that um, the uh, the lighter data are provided free of charge and can be used for any purpose. And this high resolution model is uh, one meter, uh, so it's uh, pretty detailed. And if you do some additional work on uh, on a point cloud. Uh, and um, correct some obvious mistakes 
uh, made during um, point classifications, you can really get uh, a very impressive um, digital terrain models, which then can be visual, uh, transformed into uh, 3D images, uh, which we think are very useful uh, to, to, to show how the uh, landslide affected slopes really look like. So let me just show you uh, a few examples. Uh, example number one, you see the forested ridge um, in, the, in, in the back uh, with slopes not really very much differentiated from this perspective. But if you use this high resolution LiDAR, the picture is like this. And uh, you can clearly see here uh, that the middle and lower uh, parts of the slope uh, are very extensively uh, remodeled by, by mass movements. And they are in stark contrast with very smooth slopes, which are above, uh, just molded by uh, slow going uh, soil creep or soil fluxion processes in the, in the placed Pleistocene. And um, on the models like this, uh, which show the virtual reality in a sense, uh, we can uh, delimit the landslides, we can show where they are in a way uh, which would not be possible using the conventional tools, photographs, and not, surely not uh, if you are there in the field uh, itself. So I'm just uh, pointing out some of these um, landslide affected sections of the slopes, and you see there are quite many, and they are different in terms of uh, morphology, in terms of origin and quite likely also uh, in terms of age. Some show a multi-phase development like this one, for instance, where we have uh, a younger uh, landslide, which is indicated by these thicker lines superimposed on, the, on an older one. And if you have a model like this, uh, with these uh, annotated, uh, in a way I have done it, uh, you can then relate the real lands, the real landforms, uh, which can be seen without uh, having a large terrain perspective, to these features, and we believe uh, they enlift uh, the, the the morphology, and you can under, better understand what is the head scar, what is the landslide toe, um, what is this, why the scree is located where it is, and so on. So that was one example. Uh, this is another example of the reach uh, which I showed earlier on an uh, extract from a, from a geological map. And again, you see uh, sections of the slopes which are pretty smooth with some anthropogenic elements like roads, um, see on the right, and those uh, with extremely rough topography, which uh, in some places uh, even doesn't make quite sense if you look it, um, at it the first time. Um, and again, uh, you can uh, use like these annotations of this uh, 3D uh, view and um, show the real extent of the different parts affected by, um, by mass movements, uh, pointing out also some um, secondary features, like for instance, the ponds uh, within the landslides. And again, uh, having this, uh, you can relate some real landforms like this uh, ridge top trench uh, I already showed at the, at the beginning of the lateral spreading um, uh, places. Um, this is, uh, there are some further opportunities to uh, uh, enhance this, this view. Um, in our research, uh, we uh, also apply um, shallow geophysics and uh, to get uh, information about the internal structure of these landslide affected slopes. And uh, uh, we can show this uh, electrical resistivity tomography profiles in two the, the dimensions, but you can also um, overlay them on, a, on this LiDAR derived digital elevation model. And for example, the profile A uh, show how this um, Half of volcanic rocks, uh, which is marked here by high resistivities, uh, like makes some like floating rafts on this clay bedrock um, 
indicating uh, a ridge which just completely collapsed and is subject to um, lateral spreading. And the third and the, the, the final example is this one, and again, quite a, quite a similar story. Uh, areas uh, molded by landslides of different sorts, some uh, probably at the very initial stage, like the wind clefts, uh, which are just uh, breaks in the slope, uh, but uh, indicating uh, the site of uh, ongoing uh, instability uh, with ascending warm air in winter, which causes the snow cover to disappear. Um, yeah, so these are the uh, these these are the opportunities. These are the options uh, which we work on developing into some uh, animations because you can also make like flights and going uh, around these hills, uh, making zooms uh, in or out, uh, which probably uh, or surely would help uh, to understand this even better. So uh, concluding this uh, this this like uh, report is that um, in uh, thickly forested mountain ranges, as we have, the old landslides may be just completely covered by forest communities. And therefore, they are very poorly visible. And for an untrained eye, uh, not really accustomed to landform recognition, are very difficult to recognize. And um, the, the, the larger the landslide is, paradoxically, the more difficult it is, because you can't really appreciate the complexity and context of this landslide terrain. And uh, the solution offered by the high resolution LIDAR imagery, um, and, um, and they provide an excellent opportunity to visualize, visualize what is normally invisible. Um, so that's, that's the tools which we can, we, we can use to create this virtual uh, topography and uh, and uh, annotated geomorphologically, um, and these pa these slider derived images, if if annotated, they can also be recommended to be included into interpretation panels. And the, the, uh, there is one exa one example right uh, here uh, from a very simple panel in, in one place requested by the local uh, local council from a, from a little small town um to um be uh to, to to be designed and directed in a in a spot which can be called the geosite and this is you can see that part of the panel is this 3d um visualization of of lidar no photograph would do this trick it's only in this way uh we can show the complexity of the topography so i think that's all uh from me i think it was just 15 minutes so thank you very much paula and thank you for thank listening thank you for your presentation there's a question for you in uh, from the chat um, uh, there is a possibility to predict the dynamic of land use or land cover using lidar imagery uh, to, to to predict dynamics of land cover and land use uh, from lidar no i don't think so the the, the lidar just captures uh, the topography and doesn't tell us anything about about land cover as such it, it, it shows uh, the extent of true uh, anthropogenic disturbance especially made by past mining which is now difficult to 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 recognize from from the ground but to predict the future no i don't think so okay thank you very much again piotr there is another question but that uh, is a general question that i I think that the, the next speaker that is from Omega Technology can help us um, to, uh, to answer to this question. So I, I suggest to um, move to the next uh, presentation. Thanks again, Piotr, for your presentation. And so I invite uh, Alexandro Alexandro from Omega Technology to share um, his screen. Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to first of all thank you for organizing and preparing this event and of course uh, thank you for having us. Uh, I will now share my screen. Thank you very much. Okay, let me... Okay, now can you see my screen? Um, 
just the, not the black. Just black? Yes. Uh, let me try again. Oh, it's it's not letting me share. Um, okay, I will try to. Okay, let me try log out and log in again. Okay. 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 We are waiting for you. This is the last uh, presentation given by the um, partner institution and then the last uh, uh, part of the of the webinar is devoted to the two presentation given by um, external scientists. And will be chaired by uh, Mauro Soldati. Yes, let's see if uh, we can have this connection and then uh, we will uh, move on. Okay. Okay. Now okay. you are your screen okay. is shared. Perfect. 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 Uh, okay. So okay, so thank will... you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will make a small presentation about the GOPT authoring platform and players. Okay. <clears throat> so let's begin. Um, okay, the GOPT platform consists of three main parts. Okay, the first one is the online content repository, which can be accessed by any browser. Uh, the authors can upload their content in order to be used in their 360 presentations. The second one is uh, the authoring tool, which is a Windows and Mac OS application where the authors uh, use the uploaded content to create their 360 presentations. Uh, and the third one are the player apps, um, which are also Windows and Mac OS uh, compatible. Uh, and we also have the Oculus Quest 2 app for virtual reality. Uh, so starting from the online repository, uh, <clears throat> it, supports, it supports 360 images and 360 videos, uh, which are used for backgrounds in the presentations. And we also have narrations or sounds, uh, images and 3D objects uh, to be added to uh, its presentation. Uh, the repository also provides uh, with a library of uh, free material uh, ready to use. Uh, now for the authoring tool, uh, it is used uh, after all the content has been uploaded to the platform. Uh, it is used to create the 360 uh, presentation. Uh, so first the author uh, has to create uh, the spheres uh with a 360 image or a 360 video background uh, and then inside its sphere uh, uh, a presentation uh, can be set up using audio image and 3d object files uh, these files can be positioned rotated and resized with precision uh, and also set up uh, their exact timing when they show up at the end uh, the spheres are connected to each other as the author pleases uh, to create a seamless field trip. Uh, now, uh, regarding the player's app, um, after the presentation is completed, it can be viewed uh, by the player apps. The simple way to view uh, a presentation is on screen uh, by the Windows or the Mac OS app. 
but I think the best way uh, to view its presentation is by using the Oculus Quest 2 app to view it in virtual uh, reality and enjoy the immersion it provides. Uh, I would like to talk about the technology that we used in order to develop these, um, these tools. Uh, so both authoring and uh, player apps were developed with the uh, Unity 3D engine. Uh, we use this engine uh, because it provides powerful tools like the .NET framework, for example, and the C Sharp programming language. But the most important factor um, for our choice is the variety of operating systems and platforms this engine supports. Uh, this is how we managed to create our tools for Windows, Mac OS, and also Oculus Quest. Uh, so this was my presentation. It was pretty small. Uh, thank you very much for your time and feel free to ask uh, any questions. Thank you very much, Alexandros. So we have uh, uh, time for uh, questions, if there are questions. The colleagues from uh, Leone, Christian Leone, ask if uh, um, it can be possible to load some structure from motion uh, models, but uh, you have already answered during your uh, presentation, so it was uh, clear. So if uh, there are no, no questions, we can uh, move on. So this, uh, yes, there is a question, maybe. Larissa, let's see how we can. No, sorry. No, maybe Larissa. You have a question? No, okay. So the first part of this uh, uh, webinar is closed and, and uh, now we can move to the second part. So I, I um, uh, pass the torch to uh, Mauro for this uh, uh, second part. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paola, and thank you very much to all the speakers. Uh, they have enabled us to be on time. Uh, and uh, and start uh, uh, the second part of the webinar, which is dedicated, as we mentioned before, to invited talks uh, from external scientists. Um, we thought it was important to have contributions also outside our GOVT project, and we invited uh, two contributions. One uh, from uh, an early career scientist from Hungary, and uh, uh, another one from colleagues, uh, experienced colleagues uh, from the Chengdu University of Te Technology from China. So we can uh, now start with uh, the first uh, uh, speaker. I will introduce uh, uh, here to you. Um, uh, Edina Aidu is affiliated uh, to the Department of uh, Cartography and Joint Informatics at the Eotvos Loran University in Budapest. Hungary, and her research deals uh, with uh, applications uh, in terms of GIS technologies in cartography and mapping. And she also deals with the assessment and promotion of geo-heritage, including the use of virtual reality for geotourism purposes. Uh, and in connection with the uh, geo-heritage protection, she started using remote sensing and particularly drone uh, for photogrammetric survey in a Hungarian geopark. So now I invite uh, Edina to give her talk about using drone photogrammetry for establishing a free geosite model application. Please, Edina, the floor is yours. I'm here. Okay, we can see your screen. If you could put it in presentation mode. Perfect. Perfect. Oh, thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Edina Haidu. I'm starting my PhD studies in September at the Ötvös Loránd University, Faculty of Informatics, Institute of Cartography and Geoinformatics in Hungary. My co-author, Mark Tompa, has just finished his PhD studies in Earth Science at the same institute. Our research aimed to expand geotourist science communication by creating a 3D virtual geosite model application. Protection of geoscientific heritage is a relatively young branch of geosciences. All the elements of geodiversity are less known among the general public than the concept of biodiversity. The elements of geodiversity can be separated into two parts based on whether the scientific factors exist or not. Where they exist, we can talk about geosites, which are in situ, and can we talk about geoheritage, which is ex situ. In situ means that the object is located in its original place, <clears throat> for example, the Hegyestu in Hungary, also shown in the slide. And ex situ means that it was transported from its original place to be exhibited or used. An example of this is the Iharkut dinosaur site. The findings from here are exhibited in the Hungarian Natural History Museum. These values are held together and managed by geoparks. The other side of the geodiversity is where scientific factors do not exist. We separate geodiversity sites, which are in situ, and geodiversity elements, which are ex situ. The two parts together mean the large set of the geoconservation and geotourism. Geotourism is based on the sustainable utilization and presentation of geoscientific values. In almost all cases, these refer to innominate geological, geomorphological, pedological objects, landscapes, and other formations. It includes all special landforms through which people can learn about the values of Earth science heritage. Scientists recommend presenting processes and landforms to, to tourists through field learning activities. This was the basis of geoeducation. During guide hikes, presentation, and various outdoor activities, visitors can gather background knowledge with the help of the trained guides of the geosite. Geotourism deals with the presentation and promotion of these values in balance with protection and sustainability. Geosites are the most spectacular and important elements of geotourism. Geosite types also show a diverse image in terms of natural formations rocks, caves, large stone areas, or even the landscape. Moreover, geosites have become part of the identity of the local community. Geotourism is most widely present in geoparks. The Bakony Balaton UNESCO Global Geopark, managed by the Balaton Uplands National Park, started its geoconservation and tourism work in 2012. It is located in the western part of Hungary, next to Lake Balaton. The area is rich in geoscientific heritage. There are four and five hundred million years old metamorphosed volcanic rocks and just three, four million years old volcanic rocks. The main aim of the research is to produce a 3D models of geosites for tourism visualization and geoconservation management purpose. In Italy, we chose five geosites after consulting with the geopark staff and started the work on the flying permissions. The legal background of UAV missions has changed a few years ago following the directive of the European Union. The Hungarian government decided to make this legal environment even stricter. We are obliged to book an airspace for the missions if the area is near inhabited places nature conservation areas or other dangerous or secure site. In the image in the slide, you can see the map of the airspace. The orange one is a booked airspace, while the green circle are restricted airspace due to the nature conservation areas. After getting the permission, we have to plan our missions according to the weather factors, pre precipitation, wind and temperature extremes. The photogrammetric surveys was conducted using DJI Phantom 4 Pro V2 quadrocopter with an integrated RGB sensor. We worked with two different strategies, planned and manual surveys. 
For many of service, we use a default DGI Go application with interval shots. This type of service was used in the case of quasi-vertical objects like clips because automated pets would not give good results. For planned missions, we used PIX 4D application that was installed on the Android controller of the drone. It is an easy-to-use freeware application that is highly reliable. Overall, we produce more than 1,000 images per site. For UAV missions, we applied 60% site and 80% frontal overall between, uh, overlap between images. When flying manual, we also tried to keep these values. This was not high precision survey. We didn't use RTK or LIDAR. The cause for this was the purpose of the work. We did not want extremely precise models, <clears throat> but good visualization of objects that tourists can see on their mobile phone or monitors before going to the field. In all cases, after the field work, we processed the images. A point cloud was created from the images by a photogrammetry software by the web ODM software. To do this, the photos were uploaded and they were placed specially aligned with each other. Then the sparse and dense point cloud was created, which we edited. Unnecessary parts were cut and cleared from vegetation, then the 3D model was completed, which we exported after generating the texture exactly the colors. We uploaded these models to a web storage that is open for research purpose and accessible to everyone. This is Sketchweb, with the help of which the completed models was, were shared. The final version of the display details of the model is set here, such as April colors shooting options. The settings are shown in the first picture. After setting a few options on the web service, we received a copyable pieces of code which we could easily embed it into the corresponding code part of the HTML web page that was being prepared. This can be seen in the second picture. As I mentioned, we created a website where visitors can view the models. This is the main page with a background image taken into the geopark. The navigation buttons are located on the top of the website. By clicking on them, we move to the appropriate part of the site where we can view the models or read about the topic. By scrolling down the page, we, you can go through the individual part in order. The website can be separated into two main parts, the models and the additional information from the topic. After selecting a model, only need to click on it to view it. It can be a few screen to click on the lower right corner. You can zoom in and rotate with the help of the cursor. We used HTML, JavaScript, and CSS to create this web page. The application is available on computers and phones too. The main goal of the research was to use sustainable and modern scientific communication techniques in geotourism. For this, we created 3D models of the five selected sites. The method and the sample areas can provide a good example for the presentation of additional geosites. Through the application, earth science knowledge reach more people since they can view the sites in their homes without limitation. The web application is also a great way for geotourists to see the sites before the tour. Furthermore, 3D models can be used in geoeducation as a modern and interactive element because the important formation can be viewed on them. Also, the number of geotourists in each location can be increased with the application. It is recommended that extension of the method in other geoparks, for example, in the Novograd Novograd Geopark, which is Hungary's other UNESCO Global Geopark, next to Bakony Balaton Geopark. In the upper part of the slide, you can read what supports the research was created with. Don't hesitate to contact me if you are interested or have a question about the project. In this slide, you can find the URL of the website and you can scan the QR code too. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Are there any questions? I think it is very interesting to see also an application on a UNESCO Global Geopark. So, 
a congratulations for your work there. Are there any questions from the, the audience? Otherwise, I would ask you uh, when the geopark was established and if you have a, a direct connection with the management of the park and how they, um, to what extent they consider your research and activity important for their overall purposes. Mm, this application maybe increase the uh, visitors numbers in the geoparks and in the national natural parks too. So it was uh, considered also as useful by the geopark managers, I guess. Yes. Great. <laughs> Great. Great. OK, are there any questions? I don't see any in the chat, but then if you have any, you can write down there and uh, Adina will uh, surely answer to you. Um, so we can go to the next speakers. And it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce to you uh, our dear colleagues um, from uh, the Chengdu University um, University of Technology from China, uh, Xia Wang and uh, Han Ting Zong, uh, who I had the pleasure to meet um, last June during um, their work in Europe. Uh, they had a long uh, uh, tour and survey in Europe uh, in the frame of uh, a project uh, of the International Union of Geological Sciences, the 3D outcrop uh, project, which is uh, in the frame of the DDE, IUGS Big Program. DDE stands for Deep Time Digital Earth, as our colleague will, will tell you very shortly. And um, it is a very powerful project, uh, program within which there are a series of projects, one of which is the Outcrop 3D. So we had the pleasure to be together with uh, Shia and uh, um, Hunting at the Vaillant landslide where they um, used uh, their fantastic instrumentation and tools uh, uh, to get uh, uh, 3D images of uh, the landslides and uh, the outcrop of the landslide itself. Uh, so now um, I would like to give the floor to them, uh, thanking uh, them again for their availability to be here with us, because in China it is later on in the day. So thanks after a long day to be here with us. Thank you. The floor is yours. OK, thank you, Mauro. Thank you. Could you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, and the screen sh uh, screen sharing as well. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Mauro. And uh, I would like uh, to also thank uh, Paula and uh, Victoria and all the organizers and sponsors and all the audience today. So I am Xia Wang, and uh, my colleague Han Ting is not here today. Um, sh uh, we are preparing our next trip to Namibia. Uh, tomorrow, so uh, he's busy on the preparation and he will uh, start from China, so quite long distance. I'm now in Germany, but I'm a cinematologist working in the China University, uh, in the Chengdu University of Technology. And uh, this talk will based on works from our uh, small group, including uh, geologists, uh, geophysics, and uh, students from uh, different uh, disciplines. Uh, including geology and art, which uh, Mauro has met us this summer in Europe. And um, so uh, when Mauro uh, introduced me to this uh, GOVT project, I checked the website and I read from the website said that the GOVT project aims to give all students the opportunity to get to know uh, various uh, geomorphological sites which are inaccessible or unavailable in their country or requires a time or money consuming the date. And uh, this is um, actually quite uh, similar with our goal and purpose. So as you can see from this picture I put in the first slides, so it is a reflection of an iceberg uh, in Iceland 
So um, what we want to build is like a digital reflection um, for the deep time for deep time Earth. So what you cannot touch, but you can still see the detail and you can still play with it and uh, uh, teach students or do your research from it. And uh, this project is basically uh, belongs su uh, supported by the Deep Time Digital Earth. Uh, Mauro has introduced that. This is the first IUGS Big Science Program. And also uh, we, this group from Chengdu University of Technology, we're working on the Outgrowth 3D pl platform. And we call us Deep Time Voyager. So we are uh, traveling around the world and uh, collect the data from our classic um, sections. And uh, so uh, what we want to do, we want to build an open access platform of Digital Outcorp. And also it should be an active community for 3D geological Outcorp models. And uh, we hope in the future, the content will be provided, shared and linked by users. So it should be an active commu community, but the not only a kind of platform presenting the data upload by ourselves. And now we have uh, uh, 112 digital outcorp models and uh, we have more than 100 professional earth scientist uh, users on the platform. And uh, in the future, we hope to remove the fence for research and education on earth sciences and provide new tools and pathway for research and education on earth sciences and also try to promote the research of earth sciences to the public. I think we, we do share the similar goals and purpose. And uh, how to visit the, our pro platform is um, uh, the first way, because our parent project is the DDE. So DDE has its own platform called DDE platform. It is deeptime.org. Uh, uh, and if you go to this website and then you can find the scenario section with where we are there. So DDE Outcrop 3D. So if you click here, you can link to our website or you can also visit the website directly by outcrop 3dditimeorg So uh, as I mentioned before, we are now having uh, more than 100 outcrops uh, has been uploaded to the platform. So most of them was built uh, in past uh, two or three years because uh, in China last year, uh, the China University of Geosciences, they hold the 21st uh, International uh, Cinematological Congress. But because the COVID, as we know, and uh, so all the field trips has to be online and uh, so it has to be held virtually. So that's why uh, we, uh, uh, takes the responsibility to build um, digital models for all the uh, sections that we have to use for this uh, post Congress field trips. So in total, there were uh, 15 um, uh, virtual field trips from this International Cinematological Congress has been held just based on our Outcrop 3D platform. So most of the sections are based in China uh, from our pr platform. So the trip leaders, the pro, uh, the product, those kind of uh, introduction videos, and also they upload the uh, detailed images on the model and also make explanations to the model and then show it to the participants of the virtual field trips. So uh, how do we do the data acquisition? Uh, we are basically using the photogrammetry. Uh, so, mm, so it's based on like close range photogrammetry, uh, like you fly the drone pretty close to the section, two to five, cent uh, two to five meters. Uh, so, and then you can get very precise high resolution photo from the outcrop itself and then we will process the photo, uh, including maybe some of the details are made by uh, the cameras, so, and also videos. And then after that, we made uh, models and upload to our platform. Uh, so besides the drone photogrammetry, we also do the panoramic photos 
and then uh, this will be part of the uh, material for the Outcorp and then upload to our Outcorp 3D platform. So this is uh, the data what we had from the field. So this is the drone photo and uh, this is the video and also some detailed uh, high resolution photos. So now we have a very large data set for more than 100 sections. So this is uh, the section we have used uh, for the virtual uh, field trip uh, for the International Cinematological Congress. So in total, it was 90 uh, typical geological outcrops. Most of them are based in China. And uh, because, this because of this conference, so the scientists has put a lot of description, photos, materials on these models. So if you are interested, maybe you can also go there and have a look, check out uh, how the models looks like and uh, what kind of uh, materials is uh, 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 attached to this model. So, um, so after this, um, um, so the main project to uh, model this 90 geological outcrops. So this summer we become a new idea uh, that because we are, we cannot only stay in China. We want to involve more people, more scientists from all over the world. So this summer we uh, planned a European uh, data acquisition field trip. So by the deep, deep time Voyager. Um, uh, originally we planned to start from Dubrovnik because there was an IS meeting over there, and then we will travel all around Europe and uh, take uh, collect the data and meet. Uh, friends and then uh, make uh, like uh, around 20 or 15 uh, outcrop models. But in the end, the trip was like this. So we started from Berlin. We uh, drive all through Berlin to Dubrovnik and then drive to through North and uh, go to Italy and uh, Poland, Czech Republic, Germany and France, Spain, Portugal. So it's what, it was a quite long trip. And uh, after 66 days, we uh, passed through like uh, more than uh, 17,000 kilometers and uh, we visited 14 countries, meet a lot of uh, colleagues you know, like Maurice and Mauro and uh, Alessandro and also people from Germany and this is a uh, IGCP project and also from the local museum and uh, this is uh, from the Geopark. So we had uh, a lot of help from friends from different countries. And in the end, we modeled the 24 outcrops. Uh, most of the outcrops, uh, half of them are now has been modeled and upload to the uh, outcrops 3D platform. So if you go there, you can have a look. So uh, next I gonna show uh, three example models for you. So this is Bayon Dam, uh, Mauro was there with us. So we did two parts, one, uh, model is, is this. This is uh, about the dam and the, the cliffs around the dam. And we also did another one, which is uh, the, the main part of the landslides. And this one is uh, a geological section. It's a PD boundary at uh, several section in Italy, it's dolomite area. So you can see very clear that uh, um, if you zoom in to the outcrop, to the model, you can still see the texture of the rocks. So we are really building a very uh, high resolution model into centimeter scale. And uh, this is a model from the Geopark uh, Black Bar. So this is also, we get help from the, from the local museum. So they were there and help us to, uh, to get the axis and also uh, try to introduce the geology to us. So uh, besides the model, besides the digital models, um, that, that is our main task. We also do documentary videos uh, made for uh, selected uh, GeoHeritage sites. So the purpose for this is that we, uh, we will upload those, uh, those videos to the platform. And then uh, if uh, comes a stranger or someone who is not familiar with uh, our sciences, they can also get something from this platform. 
So for example, for the Vajon Dam, we invited uh, Mauro and uh, Alessandro. I heard that Paula was uh, supposed to be there, but uh, there's something so happened that she cannot join us. But uh, thank you all for the support. And uh, we were there, we took uh, a video by John, and uh, also we, uh, in we did interview for both of them, Ma Mauro and uh, Alessandro. And uh, they give us very detailed uh, explanation about the uh, history uh, the, the, of the tsunami and the, the tragedy which happened in the last century. So we made a short video. So it's not short, it's like six, six, meter, uh, six minutes. So I only play um, a few seconds here, just let you let you know that what kind of uh, videos we are making here. And the fact that the, the I hope the you can hear his voice. By the wave that uh, rise up on mm -hmm. this uh, on this side of the valley and then jump back and then go down. Mm -hmm. okay. So on the jumping back, the, the most damaged part was that on the left side. Or <laughs> yeah. the foot of a landslide, yes. uh, you would not recognize that this is a, a landslide. Mm -hmm. we, we can move a little bit. Yes. So this is really emblematic <laughs> and is, uh, it can be considered as a a stop to tell stories about how the landslide, the paleo landslide, was not recognized. Okay, so the video was uh, filmed and uh, uh, cut by an uh, art student, which is also part of our project. So we uh, involved uh, uh, people from different disciplines, just try to uh, do more like pop science to promote this project, promote the digital um, outcome models to the public, not only for the scientists. And uh, so uh, regarding the platform, I would like to uh, give a short uh, uh, introduction to the basic mode uh, functions. So uh, basically, so you can give information to the existing models. Of course, you can upload your own model, but because of the uh, for format, so uh, our technical uh, person, they will check if the format is fit for our platform, and then they will try to uh, modify it and upload it. So basically, you can add information for all the models, like uh, what age is it, and uh, if you have any description for that, and uh, all you can uh, upload it. And also, so there's a uh, so the right part is like uh, you can upload fo photos, videos, and uh, panoramic uh, photos, and also files like references. And also, very importantly, everyone can make their own observation points. So uh, basically, based on our platform, you can make your own virtual field trip uh, for students or for anyone else. And uh, so this is a place that you can put text. Uh, text. So for most of the outcrops in our platform, uh, the scientists already put the outcrop descriptions. Uh, and uh, for the descriptions, everyone can give comments. So this is the original one for the outcrop description. And this one is uh, uh, supplementary comments by another scientist. So it's in interactive. And uh, this is uh, imaging part that you can upload and uh, so everyone can see like if you upload a geo, uh, paleo geographic map or uh, a log like a photo edited photo and it will show to the audience share to the users on this platform and this is panoramic photos so this is done by us uh, this is a, a example from the cretaceous uh, fluvial like strain section which is uh, located in shandong province it's a beautiful place. So we uh, built um, some panoramic photos for the good sections. And uh, so this is um, this is uh, another uh, very important part, I think, because uh, we need to know that who has worked in, in this section, and uh, also if there's someone uh, who uploaded pictures or descriptions? We would like to know where the um, uh, so so who pro produced it. 
so who, who belongs to this uh, intellectual um, so product and this is a reference part so you can upload the reference and uh, uh, others can have a look on it so this is uh, uh, what i mentioned uh, you can make your own observation points for example this is a small uh, mount reef mount within the long strata so you can point to this place and then upload the detailed photos and the show with others and discuss with others that what you have have seen here and what others are can expecting from this outgroup. This is uh, another uh, important function, which is measurement. So basically you can measure distance, less, wise, and also areas. Um, uh, so to for the outgroup and also this is the 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 more specific measurement like you, that you can if you choose three points and then you can measure out uh, the deep angle the deep direction this is useful for someone who are not able to visit the outgroup but still wants to do some uh, measurement or logging uh, for the uh, sections Okay, this is how we do it. Okay, this is edit. Edit is uh, uh, you put you can put the your explanation uh, as another layer uh, attached to the model, like the formation names. So the boundaries between different formation geological formations, and also like after you made all this uh, information uploading, and then you can share your concept share the information with your uh, colleagues and your friends and the public. So um, to promote this project, we are also on the social media. Uh, we This is uh, uh, a Chinese one called WeChat Channels, uh, which allows us to upload our pop science videos. Uh, we get a lot of followers and which has a good uh, reaction from the audience. And this is uh, what we are doing now is Instagram is uh, to the international users, but we don't have uh, that much of followers. So if you are interested in our project, so we are very happy to 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 have you. And uh, if you have any question, you can also uh, send message from there and we can receive it. So in the end, I would like to show a video to you. I think I still have some time. Um, so this is a video. Uh, summarizing our trip in Europe and uh, send our regards and thanks for to all the uh, participants, all the international friends. And we're in the Geoparks Platypa in Italy. We are in the Botteccione Gorge. Okay, thank you very much for your um, for all your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. And uh, this is our contact. Please also contact me after after this uh, meeting.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shia, for your uh, uh, very interesting presentation, for showing us uh, uh, the potential of virtual technology in geology, in geomorphology, and other earth sciences fields. Um, is there any any question from the audience? There are questions in the chat. Okay. So, uh, how much time did the entire acquisition of the Vaillant model take, and what was the distance from the surface to obtain a so high resolution model? This is a, a question from Christian Leone. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, so, uh, the first question is how much time did the entire acquisition for the Vaillant uh, model take? So, we didn't take the whole uh, valley. We, we only choose the three different sites, which is uh, one is close to the dam and another is uh, 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 overview of the landslide surface. And then another one is uh, uh, a part of the landslide body, which uh, created some kind of kind of thick geological models that more introduced to us. So in total, this work were done in two days. And uh, we used uh, a DJI, a small drone, DJI Mavic 3, and we fly quite close to the outcrop. Like, uh, I think, uh, so the minimal distance is around uh, two to three meters. So normally we will fly like uh, five meters uh, next to the outcrop. So did, did I answer to your question? Yeah. And there is a question from uh, Jose Novo mm -hmm. to ask uh, if you have experience with artificial intelligence based in real photo or video. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Josh. And this is a very interesting question. Uh, we are planning to do something like this, but uh, we are uh, not really started because now it's still in the initial part, initial stage. We are still trying to collect uh, as more as we can the data from different outgroups. So, but this will definitely will be one direction that we are focusing on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And then uh, there is also a contact from a geoscientist in Namibia, uh, Ingrid, uh, uh, Ingrid Stengel, who asked to contact her when, uh, when you are there. So, <laughs> okay. I've already an appointment. So, <laughs> so, so, so I were I have a flight uh, uh, start from tomorrow. So, so if I send you a message, maybe we can make we can meet the day after tomorrow. Thank you, thank you very much. Great, and I hope uh, from the GOVT perspective that we can keep uh, in touch, uh, or not only with us but uh, with all the partners, because I think that we can exchange uh, very interesting. Uh, um, discussions and uh, and uh, scientific experience on this very important field. So um, thanks again uh, to Shia and all the speakers who preceded her. And uh, now we, we go to the closing um, closing session to the conclusion uh, conclusion of uh, this webinar. Um, so uh, I would like to invite the IEG president uh, who is uh, still with us from India, Professor Sunil Kumar De, uh, to give uh, his comments and views about uh, this uh, webinar. Sunil, uh, the floor is yours. One moment, I promote him uh, as, a, as a speaker because Okay, now I think that uh, Sunil is yes. able to. Yeah, okay, good. Can you, Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so I thank you, Mauro. Yeah, yes, sorry. Sure. You can uh, disconnect the presentation. Thank you. Okay, Sunil, please go on. Anyway, Mauro, thank you very much. I thank Paula, Victoria, and especially Nikki 
and all the partners of this GOVT program. It was a wonderful session. Although I had class from 3.30, but uh, I had taken it in the morning for this program only because I love this uh, virtual geomorphology and uh, virtual technologies in geomorphological applications and all the presentations are beautiful. So I think it will be a grand success in future also. And uh, I was thinking while going through the presentations that we have done so much work in Darjeeling Himalayas, we can also prepare one, one, one session in this uh, virtual geomorphology or GOVT platform. If, although it is not allowed outside Europe, but we can do it through virtual geomorphology working group also. With this, I, I, I would like to this invite you to organize a session in 2025 September, Romania Regional Conference in Geomorphology. And I think you have many presentations ready to share among the international delegates. So I would I invite you this GOVT, uh, uh, this program, to organize a session maybe with virtual geomorphology working group or individually in Romania regional conference in geomorphology in September 2025, as well as in this uh, uh, 11th international conference on geomorphology in New Zealand, this uh, Christchurch, New Zealand in 2026. So I, I once again, thank you very much. It will be a successful one. And from our end or from my personal end, if I can help anything, please do not hesitate to tell me. And I enjoyed the whole session sitting from the very beginning and it will be a successful one. Thank you once again very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for your attendance <laughs> to, our, to our webinar and for your uh, very nice words. Um, so the, it's time to, to close this webinar. I would like to thank all uh, the speakers. So we had uh, uh, seven contributions uh, from the project partners and two contributions from external uh, scientists, uh, which showed us the potential of virtual technologies and geomorphologies. Some of them uh, focused uh, on geoheritage, some of them focused on geohazard, and some of them focused on both showing also the importance of integrating these two aspects because sometimes or actually often when we deal with geoheritage we have also to consider the possible geohazards that may affect the area where they are um, located and sometimes there are situations hazardous situations that can turn into um, uh, geoheritage in terms of uh, uh, scientific importance and the model of evolution of certain geomorphological processes. Um, so, um, thank you, thank you again. This will not be the last multiplier event uh, of uh, the GOVT project. Uh, there will be a few more. Our project will last until uh, April um, 2024. So, we may use uh, uh, the mailing list uh, and bother you with the announcement of uh, uh, the next uh, multiplier events, if you don't mind. Um, greetings also from uh, Professor Arjen Ströven from, uh, and his team from the University of Stockholm, who are coordinating this project. Arjen was not able to be with us uh, due to um, uh, research activities outside his uh, um, university. Uh, so, but uh, he he will be with us for sure in the next multiplier events and say hello to any of you who would like to join us again. So thanks uh, for being with us uh, and uh, uh, let's meet uh, the next time. Bye bye everybody. Bye, thank you very bye much. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye, -bye. thank you very much. Bye bye, thank you. <laughs>